Thank you. I'll be very quick uh, because I want to turn the mic over to our speaker, who many of you know as the chair of the theology department here uh, at the university. Uh, but I think, as it very often happens, you know, you see the name on your schedule, and you know, it sort of stops there. So I want to fill out the bio a little bit and let you know, uh, you know, his his role in in the the world of of theology, an exciting world it is, I think myself. Um, but j just to give you a, a couple of ideas of, of some of the things that he's been working on, I first uh, encountered Ken's uh, writing in a class that I taught, and I used a book that, that he co-wrote with his brother Michael called Fullness of Faith, The Public Significance of Theology, and it's very much related to the topic that he's going to be speaking about this evening. He raises questions in much of his writing uh, that parallel the kinds of things that were discussed at last week's event with the two senators. I'm sure some of you were at that event uh, in Conti Forum last week. Uh, you know, the, ba the basic issue is, does one's religious faith, and by extension, does one's language and reflection upon that faith have any meaning for public life, for political life, for the way that one engages in the public square in uh, debates about the common good? This is a central question that Ken has raised. Uh, and I want to give you just a, a sampling of, of some of the titles um, of things that, that he has worked on. In addition uh, to that one that I mentioned, to that, uh, to that book that he mentioned, he's authored uh, quite a few that deal with the question of just war. So I'll give you um, this example. Hard Questions About Just War that he published uh, in uh, the journal America just um, last year, last uh, fall as a matter of fact. Um, he's also uh, written on Catholic social teaching, which many of you know is, is an extensive body of, of reflection on you know, some fu fundamental issues in um, in the church's tradition that speak to questions of, of ethics today, uh, from uh, you know just wages to organization in, in labor movements to again just war uh, and a host of other uh, issues. So uh, suffice it to say that uh, that Ken Himes has been very much engaged in this larger question of the relationship between one's uh, membership in the community of faith and one's participation in the wider community. Um, of civic life, and I think these are compelling questions. I'll close with a paraphrase of, uh, of, of a quote that, that, that Ken gave uh, to the Heights back when he came to BC in 2004. He was asked uh, by uh, the interviewer you know, what it was like to come to Boston College when his older brother Michael was already here and, and was well known by many of us in this room. And, and, and Ken's response, and you'll correct me if I got this wrong, but his response was, well, the name of Himes is, is of course, connected to great teaching and, and fine public speaking, and I'm here to change all that. So without further ado, I give you uh, Ken Himes. Thanks, Tim. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. I realize uh, you've got lots of things coming on your schedule now with exams and papers and all those sorts of things. So I appreciate your showing up tonight. Uh, one of the things that will be pretty obvious to you as I start to talk is uh, I don't sound like my brother. Uh, there's a reason for that. When we were kids growing up in Brooklyn, my brother was... Uh, rather precocious as a young man and uh, he, uh, he used to spend his time even when he was in grammar school listening to the original recordings of the Doyle Lee Cart Opera Company singing uh, Gilbert and Sullivan operettas like the Pirates of Penzance that's been playing for Arts Festival where I grew up listening to Red Barber broadcast Brooklyn Dodger games on my little transistor radio. So uh, I sound like a Brooklyn Dodger and he sounds like an English opera singer. Uh, that's the difference between us in some ways. What I thought I'd do tonight uh, with you for a little bit is uh, provide some perspective on this question of being American and Catholic. Uh, the reason for doing that is to appreciate the fact that for most of the history of the American Catholic community, it was an open question whether those two things went together well or not. And, uh, and those, those questions again get raised every now and then. You find people raising questions about how easily does this hyphenated identity of American-Catholic work. 
And, uh, and that question's been around for a while, and I thought I might just try and historically situate that for you, and then do that in kind of three historical moments for you. And uh, I'm glad that people like Jim O'Toole and Steve Schlesser and Dave Quigley and others in the history department are in here, because this is going to be a very kind of quick and dirty look at 250 years or so of American Catholicism. But uh, then I want to just simply end with posing some, uh, some questions and perhaps uh, a future perspective as a way to think about this issue. Okay? And then we'll just throw it open for your comments or questions or reactions. Uh, the first historical moment. Right from the get-go, the thing to understand about American Catholics were they saw themselves very much as a minority within the larger Protestant American community. That American Catholics understood themselves to be something of a beleaguered minority. The, the Catholic population was very small during the colonial era. Uh, at the time of American independence, the Catholic population was largely concentrated in two colonies, Pennsylvania and Maryland, because they were the two colonies that basically practiced religious freedom and allowed uh, Catholics to settle there. In many other parts of the colonial, uh, colonial America, uh, Catholics were not allowed to worship in public, or at least were looked down upon for their practices and their beliefs. Uh, papistry was a universally sort of abusive term that was used to describe uh, Catholic belief. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is this, this minority group is, as most of the colonies were, overwhelmingly English Catholic, or English in origin. They are very much like their peers in the colonies, except for their religious faith. Indeed, uh, most of the evidence we have would suggest that these early Anglo-American Catholics were probably a little better off than the typical colonist. Uh, in, in America at the time. That is because, among other things, if you were a member of the aristocracy or doing fairly well in England, there was very little reason to leave England and come to the New World if you were Protestant. But if you were Catholic, even if you were doing okay financially, or even if you were of aristocratic ancestry, that was no security that you would continue to experience freedom and equality in a kingdom where at times Catholic persecution rose up. And so many people who, had they not been Catholic, might have stayed in England, instead ventured across the Atlantic to come into the US. So that the Anglo-Catholic population was, for its time, reasonably well-educated, reasonably well-off financially, reasonably concentrated in these two colonies of Pennsylvania and Maryland. Now, the strategy that these Anglo-Catholics adopted right after the Revolutionary War and the formation of, the, of the, uh, uh, the American nation, the strategy they adopted was basically what we might call playing down their distinctiveness. That is, John Carroll, who was the first native bishop, American bishop, the Catholic bishop uh, of this community, uh, and was the founder of Georgetown University. Carroll, as early as the 1790s, was writing to Rome asking permission for American Catholics to celebrate the Mass in English. He was asking for permission to uh, change the way priests dressed and the lifestyle of priests all because these sorts of things, you see, made Catholics stand out when compared to their fellow colonists. And what he wanted to do was rather allow Catholics to fit in and blend in with this wider Anglo-American population. And so his strategy was to sort of play this down, and what would be distinctively Catholic would be sort of kept out of public view simply because, in his view, and in the view of many others, most Protestant Americans looked somewhat suspiciously on American Catholics for a variety of reasons. One very simple one was, there was always a question about, 
are these American Catholics really going to be loyal to the new nation, or will their loyalty be to that fellow in Rome who really runs their lives? And so you had very early on in the history of American uh, uh, political life questions being raised about the patriotism of American Catholics and where their loyalties really lay. Now, this strategy of uh, sort of blending in and Anglo-Catholic anxieties to blend in uh, change, changes fairly soon. If you think of the Constitution, 1789, right? By 1920, so in 31 years, things begin to change. And what changes is, in 1820, you begin to get the first waves of massive immigration from Ireland. And most of the Irish immigrants coming over are Catholic. Most of these Irish Catholics obviously do not fit in. They may speak English, but they speak it with a brogue, right? They come over, they don't have the history that the Anglo-Catholics have. They come in such great numbers that they begin to overwhelm the tiny Anglo-Catholic population. By 1840, of course, you have the potato famine. More than one million Irish die as a, re as a result of that, in terms of starvation. Between 18... 56, 1846 and 1851, in that five-year period, more than one million Irish emigrate to America in five years. Previous to that year, between 1820 and 1846, an earlier one million had come. This already far outnumbers the Anglo-Catholic population that was here to receive them. So that fairly quickly, you see, the tenor of the American Catholic community becomes a community that is imaged and understood to be an immigrant community. No longer is it this community of aristocratic Anglo-Catholics who are like their counterparts in Protestant America, but now being Catholic means you're an immigrant, you're not of English ancestry, your customs, your folk ways are different. And indeed, many of these English come with a particular distaste for the English because they understood the English people to be their oppressors throughout history. By about uh, 1840, uh, just as that huge crisis of the potato famine on Ireland begins to happen, you also begin to get some of the early waves of German immigration coming into the country. And German and Irish immigration continue unabated right on through the 19th century, and in the late 1870s, 1880s, they're joined by Italian immigration begins around this period, Polish immigration, Hungarian immigration, and French-Canadian immigration. In addition to this, of course, you have Hispanic Catholics who don't so much emigrate to America as they get annexed into America, as America begins to claim the properties of the Southwest, all of a sudden, Hispanic Catholics, who haven't moved at all, find that all of a sudden the borders have been re redrawn, and they're now in the United States, where before they thought of themselves as being in Mexico. But what begins to happen, you see, is you have this massive wave of immigrants that comes in from the period 1820 to 1920. These people, other than the English, do not speak English as their second language. They have a whole set of customs and folkways and manners and the hymns they sing and the prayers they say and the foods they like and the way they dress. All these things distinguish them from the Protestant American majority. And so Catholics do stand out. There's no possibility of them blending in. And the church has to develop a different strategy for dealing with these people for a couple of reasons. One. These Catholics do not understand themselves as this beleaguered minority who came from England, who had to consciously, against the majority, choose to be Catholic. But rather, these people understand themselves as being Irish, or being Bavarian, or being Polish, or being Italian means you are Catholic. That their ethnicity and their cultural history 
is wedded very closely to their Catholicism so that they don't see a gap between being Italian and being Catholic. They don't see a gap between being Irish or Bavarian, German, and Catholic. Everyone they knew in the old country was Catholic. So that Catholicism for them was not so much a conscious choice against a majority, but rather it was sort of simply the way one was brought up. It was part of one's cultural identity. So the great challenge is, as these people come to America and begin to separate themselves from that culture, and as you can imagine, their children and their children's children grow up not knowing their parents' language, not knowing their parents' customs and folkways and history. One of the great concerns that Rome had about American Catholics were, as they lost their Frenchness, their Irishness, their Germanness, their Italian sense of it, as they lost these identities, would they also lose their Catholic identity? And so there was great concern that changes in language and folkways and customs and family traditions, that this would undermine people's religious commitments as well. So Rome looks at this community of American Catholics somewhat suspiciously that their faith will not be solid and anchored in anything as their cultural and ethnic heritage evolves. And the Protestant community looks at these people with suspiciousness that they're really not Americans. They're really more loyal to the their former countries or their former ways than they are to the new American nation. And so the early Catholic community in the 19th century kind of gets this double whammy. On the one hand, there's suspicion from Rome about are you really going to be Catholic? And there's suspicion from fellow Catholics, are you really going to be an American? Now there were different ways of dealing with this. But one of the things that American Catholics did, of course, was they very quickly did try within a couple of generations to assimilate. And the patterns of assimilation then are not much different than now. First generation that comes over usually doesn't learn the language or learn it well. Tends to, set, tends to settle into kind of, uh, you might say, immigrant ghettos where most of the immigrants come together and support one another. They remain a certain distance from American culture, don't fully understand it, don't fully like it, sort of look back somewhat nostalgically at times on their former uh, uh, country. The second generation born in this country is kind of eager to settle in. They don't like going to school and being ridiculed because they have accents. They don't like being made fun of because their parents can't speak the language. They don't like being made fun of because they eat odd foods or they dress in odd ways. They want to fit in. And the third generation usually can't even speak to their grandparents. Those patterns of the way migrant communities uh, settle in have been fairly consistent over the lifespan of American history with the slight difference of the Hispanics in the Southwest, which is its own story, which we can't get into right here, but we can take up later on if you'd like. But what you have then is this. You have this situation of uh, American Catholics beginning to blend in. And this second wave, the second stage of the history, after that very short period of Anglo-American Catholicism, this new wave of immigrant Catholicism, the great issue the church tries to deal with is, how do we help people hold on to their faith even as they assimilate into this largely Protestant American culture? And the solution, among many, but the basic style of solution that the American Catholic community adapts is, we will create institutions that help mediate American culture to our people, but on our terms. So what happens is the American Catholic community creates its own school system. It creates its own health care system. It creates its own network of charities and various social organizations. So you have Catholic charities, the largest single social welfare organization in the United States outside of the federal government. You have Catholic Relief Services outside of, uh, I think it's CARE, it is the second largest 
uh, international development service that's not governmentally owned. The Catholic health care system is the largest health care system in the United States outside of the Veterans Administration. The Catholic school system is the largest private school system in the United States, both at the parochial level and there are more private Catholic universities than any other, or any other uh, segment of the population. And of course, when you die, you get buried in a Catholic cemetery. You know, I mean, so what happened was Catholicism created this kind of parallel culture to the wider Protestant culture. And this parallel culture was you got born in a Catholic hospital to Catholic parents. You went to Catholic schools. You played in CYO sports, Catholic youth organization sports. You met your future spouse at the CYO dances that were chaperoned by the priests, all right? You went off to Catholic college. You may have joined a Catholic professional association or club. When you got married, you got married in a Catholic church, largely to another Catholic for the most part, all right? You raised your children up in Catholic schools. When you got sick, you went to a Catholic hospital. And when you died, you got buried in Catholic cemeteries. It was a kind of parallel society. Right? Now, we then move into, or start to move into, what I think are the two most important events in the history of American Catholicism, and they have nothing to do with the church, per se. The first one happens in 1924. And what it is, is the passage of the Johnson Immigration Act. In 1924, for the first time, the federal government sets quotas on immigration. Now, why that's important is this. You're saying, those Irish who came in 1820, or the Germans who came in 1840, by 1920, they're long gone and off the scene, and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are here. Those people have assimilated. Those people have sort of fit in. Those people have been educated. They've done well in life. They've moved up in terms of their economic and educational standing. They have done pretty well. And so you might say, well, they seem to have joined the middle class. But while that was going on, you see, there still was another wave of immigrants coming behind them. So even as the 1820 or 1840 immigrants, their grandchildren were now fitting in and assimilated in 1900 or 1920, there still is another whole wave of immigrants coming in in 1900 or 1920 behind them. So what happens, you see, is Catholicism maintains this image of being an ethnic, blue-collar, working-class church. Catholics are understood to be largely ethnic and urban. We tended to settle in the major centers of urban population in the Northeast and in the Upper Midwest. They used to refer to the major kind of Catholic triangle in the Midwest of Cincinnati to Milwaukee down to St. Louis, including the cities within that. In the Northeast, it was Baltimore, Philadelphia, up to Boston, down to New York. That these areas had large, large concentrations of Catholics within the cities there. But these Catholics tended to be seen as blue collar, working class, ethnic people even though perhaps many others had already assimilated, the image of Catholicism remained that, because there was always the steady wave of immigrants coming into the country. When you stop that steady wave with the Immigration Act of 1924, what happens, you see, is by the 1940s and 50s, as those people who came in 1910 and 1920 have their children or grandchildren begin to assimilate, you have far less immigrants coming behind them. So that now, the American Catholic community slowly begins to evolve from being this ethnic blue collar people to people who start to assimilate because of the limits on immigration. And the assimilation really advances by the second great thing that happens to the American Catholic community. In 1944, 20 years after the Immigration Act, you have the GI Bill and World War II. And what the GI Bill does is two important things for the American Catholic community, or three, really. The first is the experience of war. American Catholics are thrown into the military in large numbers with American Protestants. 
and all of a sudden Protestants are fighting side by side by Catholics and finding out, gee, they're not odd. You know? Gee, they don't have two heads. You know? Gee, they're not sending telegrams back to the Pope giving him troop movements. You know? uh, gee, these German and Italian Catholics are fighting against Germany and Italy. Maybe they really are American. These Irish Catholics are not fighting against England, but fighting with England on the Allied side. And all of a sudden you see some of the mystery of this Catholic population begins to wither away as many Protestants, for the first time in their life, have close, intimate connections with Catholics and begin to see, well, they're not that much different than me. But then the GI Bill kicks in, two great things happen. One, Catholic returning GIs get a stake and are able to afford college. And you find large numbers of Catholics going to college for the first time in the history of the American Catholic community. What that does, you see, is all of a sudden this blue collar, you know, labor union joining working class church begins to churn out white collar managerial professional type people. And all of a sudden the image of Catholics begins to change because the educational levels and the consequent economic levels of Catholics change. So much so that now in the United States, Irish Catholics, German Catholics, and Italian Catholics, as three different groups in this country, all rank higher in years of formal schooling and years of and per capita income they all rank higher than Episcopalians. That, let me suggest to you, is a revolution in a culture. Right? The traditional church of the Anglo-Protestants now ranks lower than three groups of ethnic Catholics. The second thing that happens here is <clears throat> that the second part of the GI Bill is it stakes people to getting mortgages to buy homes. And what that does, you see, is, and I would wager that probably if you went back and talked to your grandparents about this, you'd find out that many of them grew up in those major cities of the Northeast or up in Midwest. But then with the GI Bill, they could afford the first time someone in the family had a down payment on a mortgage, and all of a sudden they moved to the suburbs of those cities. And American Catholics begin to move out from these urban ethnic enclaves where they were understood to be this sort of dominant group controlling these big cities, both politically and in some cases financially. They begin to move out into the suburbs, and all of a sudden, the O'Toole's and the O'Shaughnessy's and the Pulaski's and the Ferraras are living next to the Goldbergs and the Silversteins and the uh, the Richardsons and the Smiths and the, uh, the Ascots. And all of a sudden, you see, they're having you know, cocktails in the backyard with people who previous generations would have thought of them as sort of inferior and unfortunate blights upon the American landscape. So what happens, you see, is assimilation begins to happen dramatically after World War II. And the 50s and the 60s, you begin to have this convergence now of American culture and Catholic culture that it seems to be this easy wedding. The symbolic victory of this, of course, was 1960 when John Kennedy is elected President of the United States, the first American Catholic to be elected so. This is seen as a major symbolic statement that Catholics have arrived, that Catholics can run this country that Catholic patriotism is no longer suspect. But now we move to our third stage in the history. The third stage is this. A funny thing happens on the way to assimilation. And the funny thing that happens is the civil rights movement, Vietnam, the sexual revolution, and Roe v. Wade. Because what happens is, in the 50s and early 60s with the civil rights movement, just as people are beginning to feel Catholic with or comfortable with, I'm Catholic and American, people begin to raise questions about the state of American society and American culture. 
that the civil rights movement begins to unravel and uncover one of the ugly sides of American life, namely its racism. Vietnam begins to uncover in the 60s another ugly side of the American story, namely its violence and its aggression and imperialism at times. Now, people on the left tend to take up that critique. And the critique becomes, maybe we shouldn't want to assimilate into this culture. Maybe this culture is not something that Catholic people should be part of because you sacrifice gospel values to fit into this culture. This culture is inherently racist, inherently violent. Why should we think we should blend into it? And you get this critique from the left of Catholic assimilation. Then also in the 60s, you have the sexual revolution that begins to happen. And with that, you begin to have higher rates of out of wedlock births, much higher divorce rates in the country at large and in the Catholic population at large. Many more people living together who aren't married. That continues to such a degree that right now there is virtually no difference between American Catholics and the wider American population on issues where before Catholics thought of themselves as standing out. Stability of marriage, children born within the context of marriage, and people not living together until they were married. The statistics for the American Catholic community and the American society are virtually indistinguishable about this. That would have been unimaginable, unimaginable to your grandparents. Right? That we were different in those areas was a point of pride for American Catholics. It was our way of saying, see, you Protestants really don't get it. You know, we live the gospel, you don't. Right? It was actually seen as a way of sort of criticizing Protestant America. But now, in the 60s, those standards and norms begin to break down for everybody. And so now the critique of the culture comes not only from the left over Vietnam and civil rights, it starts coming from the right about people who are upset about family values, family standards, and the like. And it gets capped off, of course, in the early 70s with the Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade and the legalization of abortion. And now you have people saying, how could America and American culture allow this widespread resort to abortion as a way of dealing with difficult pregnancies? And so you begin to have the right, you see, raising the same question as people are coming from the left on. Namely, maybe Catholic and American doesn't fit together too well. Maybe Catholic and American is problematic because indeed, the American culture is seen to be somehow threatening or inimical to Catholic beliefs and practices. Now, while that's going on, you could say there are two takes on these phenomena. <clears throat> the radical critique is that something is fundamentally askew with America, that there is something fundamentally problematic about the American project and you begin to get revisionist history that begins to point out the violence, the imperialism was there long before Vietnam. Just look at what we did to Native Americans, right? or what we did to Hispanic Americans in the Southwest. And there begins to be this critique that at the very fabric of American life, there are problematic things. And you get people like a Dorothy Day, or the Berrigan brothers, Dan and Phil Berrigan, or you get James Grappi, a priest in Milwaukee, or others, who begin to make this fairly radical critique that the only way to really authentically be a Catholic Christian is to be in opposition to American culture. One must be in sort of a fundamental state of conflict with America because America is at war with Catholic values. There's a uh, cartoon in New York a years ago, I remember, it was published around Thanksgiving time, a couple of years ago, and it was a, uh, a cartoon of these uh, uh, two or three pilgrims, and they're leaning over, you know, the bow of the Mayflower, and they're looking out at this uh, mass of land where there are some Native Americans, they are waving at them and smiling as the Mayflower is starting to arrive. And the, uh, the one uh, pilgrim says to the other, oh yeah, sure, sure, uh, yeah, I came for religious freedom, but eventually I want to get into real estate. 
And of course, uh, the cartoon captures something very important about immigration. Uh, we tell ourselves the story that people came to this country for freedom, right? That America has always been about freedom. That's the great project. We come to this country for freedom. And there's some truth in that. But the other reality is, people also came to this country because they were on the make economically. They wanted to live better in a material sense than they were living in their former countries. And the simple reality is that for many Americans, in the 50s and 60s, those dreams seemed to have come true. People knew they were living better than their grandparents. They knew they were living better than their parents. They had hopes that their children would live better than them. They knew that they had things in terms of material possessions and economic security that they knew cousins or former second cousins who never left their former countries, they knew they were living better than these people. They knew they experienced a certain measure of freedom and a certain measure of an open political system. And so for most Americans, they were not prepared to make this kind of radical critique of America that the stronger critics on the left and the right were prepared to make. And so what you found was people just simply looking at their own experience, their own family histories, and they were saying to themselves in one way, shape, or form or another, America has been pretty good to me. You know? America has done right by my family. And therefore what you would find is, at most, the average American Catholic was prepared to be critical without being radical in their attitude towards American culture. And people begin to think about, how can I then, once again, put these two things together? I'm proud to be Catholic, but I'm also proud to be American. And I'm not prepared to take that kind of radical disjunction that either on the left or the right was offering. At the same time, I'm willing to acknowledge some of the problems in American culture, and therefore I'm not prepared to simply say, wedding my Catholic faith with my American identity as if they're one and the same. And that, I think, leads us to the strategic question, and I'll stop with this. <clears throat> Given this kind of history, and granted it's painted in very large, you know, broad generalizations, uh, but given this kind of history, one of the questions that seems to me we can pose to ourselves is, how do we relate our faith to our culture? Want me to see our religious convictions as inimical to American culture? Or do we see our culture as supportive of our religious convictions? Do we see ourselves as having to live a parallel existence, like Catholics in the 30s and 40s, creating their own institutions apart from the mainstream institutions? in order to have an influence in public life? Or can we work with existing institutions? Uh, to make that very concrete, do you need institutions like this? Do you need, quote, Catholic colleges and universities? Or are these, are these replicas of a bygone era? You know, we could all go for a lot less tuition to UMass, right? I could pay there for a lot less salary at UMass if I wanted to be there, right? So one of the questions we could, do, do we need Catholic hospitals? Why, why do we need these, quote, Catholic institutions? Do they serve a purpose anymore in this culture and society? If so, what purpose do they serve in the culture? What's their usefulness for us? Another question is, <clears throat> Who should we focus on in our care? Should we focus on in on our own, which was the immigrant approach, you see? You took care of your own. Or should we be concerned about the wider society? Should all people in need be our concern? Or should we take care of our own? There's plenty of poor Catholics out there. Indeed, one of the great challenges that you're going to have to face in your lifetime, I'm, I mean, I'm not just, I'll be here too, I hope, for a while, but certainly in your lifetime, one of the great challenges you're going to have to face is you, the people who are the successes to those early immigrants, how are you, the generation of older immigrants, going to relate to the new wave of Catholic immigrants? 
poor Haitians, poor Central Americans, poor Filipinos and Koreans, people who are coming not from the traditional European ancestry, but coming to us from the Caribbean, Central America, and Asia. How will we relate to the next wave of immigrants who tend to be people of color, tend to have poor educational backgrounds, and tend to have financially be in much worse conditions than most of our families are? Will the gap in the future not be a gap between Catholics and the wider population, will the gap be between Catholics and Catholics of two different immigrant groups. Those who came from largely white Western European cultures versus those who come as people of color from other regions of the world. That's going to be a real challenge for the Catholic community in the future. How are we going to bridge those gaps between those two groups? So who should be the focus of our efforts at reform? Should we be looking out for our own, or should we be focusing on the wider society? Another question to ask ourselves is, in doing all this, are we in step or out of step with the wider culture? Catholics were very much in step on issues like Vietnam. We were very much out of step on the Mexican Revolution or the Spanish Civil War. We participated almost not one whit in the abolitionist movement of the 19th century, largely because the Irish figured they were just one step above the black population in this country at the time. They saw the massive freedom of freeing of black slaves to be economically threatening to them. Their view was, we'll take care of ourselves, let the blacks take care of the blacks. Do we engage in that kind of crass politics? Can you bring about change in society if you, in fact, are out of step with the wider society? Can minority groups bring about significant change, or do minority groups have to always forge alliances and consolidate with others to bring about social change? That's always one of the questions of social reform, right? Can prophetic minorities work the change, or do you need to have larger, more broad-based constituencies that constitute majorities, but in doing that, you water down the message, you lose some of your energy and motivation, you spread out the levels of commitment. Those kinds of questions are all there, because one of the issues is, now that American Catholics, in significant numbers, are so well assimilated politically, in terms of access to power, we are by far the largest group in the US Congress, right? both in the Senate and in the House, more Catholics elected to both those houses than any other religious group, by far. We are the largest group now among CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Right? As I mentioned before, many American Catholics have very high per capita incomes. Right? Years of formal education, we are well above the norm in this country. In short, we are the establishment in many ways. We are the power brokers of the society. How do we use that power? How do we build bridges with others or do we choose to go alone and forge our own agenda? What are the issues we're going to choose to rally around? What are the things that we're going to say are our priorities or we're going to care about? Those are the kinds of questions I want to suggest to you. Every generation of Catholics have to answer them. Every generation has answered them somewhat differently depending upon their social location and depending upon the historical era. You and I are now living in an era very different than those Anglo-Catholics of the 18th century, very different in many ways from the immigrant Catholics of the 19th century, but also somewhat chastened by the debates and the arguments and the polarization of, you might say, that radical challenge to assimilation in the middle of this century, of the 20th century, rather. So what does the church of the 21st century look like? It's a, it's a choice, it seems to me, that we can back into somewhat unintentionally, or it's a choice we can make somewhat intentionally and consciously. But if it's going to be made, it's going to be made by the likes of you. Right? You are going to be the people who make it. On a very small point, 
Clerical leadership in this country is diminishing rapidly in numbers, as you know. Right? Less than 1% of Catholics are priests or religious. And I don't know of any successful movement that's ever been led by less than 1% of a population. Right? It's the American Catholic laity that will or will not make a difference on questions of social reform and in questions of making this a more just nation than we are now. So that, it seems to me, are the choices we have before us. That, it seems to me, is the heritage and the history that we are part of. The question of what we do with that history, it doesn't predetermine us. It doesn't force us into any particular position. But knowing that history and being informed by it, we can ask ourselves, how will we be faithful to it? How will we build upon it? Thanks for your time. About 20 or 25 minutes uh, for some Q&A, and um, just want to, uh, if you could hold the mic so that people can hear you when you have any questions. So who's the first person uh, that wants to take a stab at asking a question? Hi. Hi. Um, you talked a lot about Catholic American Catholics' relationships to other Americans and to other American Catholics, but how does the American Catholic movement interact with Rome, and how do you see as, that as changing in the yeah. future? Good question. Uh, I think one of the things we have to face is this. One of the realities that happened to American Catholicism, precisely because of the events and the movements we've been talking about here is, uh, I'll, I'll make it very concrete and put it in terms of my, my family. <clears throat> my father was a, uh, a union man. Uh, if you know the New York City subway system, my father was the guy in the token booth. My father sold tokens all his life. He worked for the Transit Worker Union of New York City, and he was the guy who made change in the token booth. That's what he did all his life. <clears throat> my father never ran a meeting in his entire life. My father never formulated a budget. My father uh, never spoke in public, to my knowledge. Right? Unimaginable to him that his sons do what we do. Right? Uh, no one ever asked my father's opinion on just about anything. Right? My father took orders. Right? My father basically was told what to do. His job was fairly narrow and you know, limited. Uh, he just went in every day. He punched the clock. He made change for people. He put his coat on, he left the booth, and he came home at night. That was his life, right? Uh, he went to church. He did the church just like he did at work. He walked in, he sat down, he listened to other people talk, and he expected other people to tell him what to do. My sister, all right, my sister went to college. She's a dietitian. For a number of years, she ran uh, a whole... Uh, a nursing home, uh, a group of nursing homes in Long Island. Uh, she ran the kitchens for all of them. She had several dozen employees who answered directly to her. She, along with the financial management of the nursing home system, uh, did the food budgets. Uh, she made up the menus. She oversaw the cooks. Uh, she oversaw the helpers. Uh, she was uh, a real player in this nursing home system in terms of both authority in terms of responsibility, in terms of giving orders. Uh, my sister expects to be consulted. My sister, no one tells my sister what to do. She tells them what to do, right? My sister doesn't go to church, right? But the last time she did, I can tell you, she didn't sit there just waiting for father to tell her what to think or do, right? In one generation, the difference between my sister and my father is dramatic. And what changed was education. What changed was the experience that you're having. You're in a place like this, which is a marketplace of ideas. Right? You don't hear one idea in a given day. You hear dozens of ideas. You don't hear one range of opinions. You hear dozens of opinions. You can pick and choose any number of ideas or ways to think or strategies for living. It's all out there. And you realize that you have to make some choices as to how are you going to live faithfully and authentically for yourself by what you believe in. Right? Things aren't a predetermined script for people like yourselves. You understand yourselves as having to be persuaded and convinced. Think of how you're listening to me right now. You may be saying to yourself, 
I like what you say except for that, or, uh, yeah, but what about this example? Or, uh, I gotta think about that. that. That's not my recollection of how the uh, 19th century looked the way you're describing it. In other words, you don't sit here and say, oh, whatever Heim said, that's what I believe. Instead you say, I'll hear what Heim says to say, I'll make up my own opinion, right? That's a significant moment, you see, in the life of the church, when people all of a sudden think that they have not only the freedom, but they have the right to think for themselves. They have the duty to exercise judgment, to make decisions, to listen to what other people have to say, to factor into it ideas, but don't just simply say, tell me what to believe. Instead you say, let me hear what you have to believe and let me see how persuasive and believable that is to me. Right? When that happens, you see, that's not a matter of disloyalty. That's not a matter of somehow being unfaithful to the church. You know what that is? That's just simply a matter of educational psychology. How do adults learn? And adults don't learn by being dictated to. Adults learn by being invited to think, reflect, test ideas, measure it against their own experience, consult with other people whom they value to ask how this opinion fits in with that. And maybe if the time you come around to say, I'm pretty much where you are on this, but you don't say it automatically, right? It's a matter, in other words, not so much of theology, it's a matter of educational psychology, right? That's a move, it seems to me, that creates great tensions, or at least potentially creates great tensions with Rome, right? Because Rome has operated, remember, an institution that's operated for 2,000 years, right? It's an institution that throughout a good deal of its history, all right, the best educated, best trained, most articulate, most persuasive people were all trained as clerics. They were the people with formal education. They were the people who had a wider range of experience. And so the church has lived through a long period of time in which it understood to be authority flowed from ordination and from being a cleric. And they are now, the church is now confronting societies such as ours where people have authority, not by those titles, but they have authority by the years of training, their education, the use of their intelligence, the experiences that they have. It creates a different educational dynamic, right? It's entirely different. It's the difference between how you learned when you were in the first or second grade and the teacher said something, or how you learn now in a classroom when a teacher says something, right? You're open to being instructed, but you're certainly not open to being forced or dictated to. So if the church is going to persuasively teach in the future, it has to be persuasive. Coercion is not going to work. Threats are not going to work. So if my response to your question was, you ask that question again, and I'm going to throw you out of here, you might conclude, Heinz is a little touchy on this topic, you know? <laughs> but what you certainly wouldn't conclude is, boy, Heinz won that argument, right? In other words, what a good teacher does when confronted by a question, and you've seen good teachers here at BC, right? What does a good teacher do when confronted by a question? Great question, good point. How about this? A good teacher takes that question as an opportunity to teach better. Let me give you another example. Let me give you some more evidence. How does this fit with your experience? Remember when you read that book a couple of weeks ago? Do you see what they said then is what I'm saying now? In other words, what a good teacher does is uses the question to engage in a more persuasive, more explainable way of helping you come to see for yourself what the truth is. What a good teacher doesn't do is simply say the same thing over again louder, right? And what a good teacher doesn't do is threaten you that you're not going to be a faithful member of this class if you ask a question like that. Instead, what a good teacher tries to do is persuade and explain better. That's what the church has to get better at, right? We've got to get better at persuasion and explanation because too often we have relied upon formal authority. I'm the cleric. Pay attention to me. Right? Rather than, your question's a good one, let me think about how I can make it more understandable to you. Let's think about how that make, might make more sense in light of your experience. But that's a different kind of challenge and a different style of teaching. And we're living in a time where there's some tension between those two models of teaching. I think Jim Keenan was here a month or two ago, 
And uh, I think Jim was telling me he was talking about the fact, that, and it's absolutely true. We have had arguments for 2,000 years in the Christian tradition. Right? It's not this seamless garment of we've all said the same thing forever. We've been arguing for 2,000 years. What keeps you in the church is you think the conversation is worth having. You don't want to drop out of the conversation. It doesn't mean the conversation is a monologue. Yes, so, Marina. Um, what would you say is the validity of being a Catholic in an American society? And You're going to have to say it again, Marina. They're going to munch into it on the mic. Hello? Okay. Yeah. What would you say is the validity of being an American and Catholic and still choose to be isolated and not partake in the social issues of the rest of the world? Well, it's a tough one. I mean, I think, you know, different people are confronted with different choices in their life. Uh, you look at the early church. Basically, it's a fairly ragtag group of Semites living in uh, a distant region of the Roman Empire. Uh, and they have little or no influence or power over that empire, right? I mean, you know, the empire, you know, the emperor doesn't run for office, right? There's no election for emperor, right? And uh, there is no civilian, re uh, you know, uh, civilian review board when someone complains that the Roman ar army abused my human rights, you know? I mean, it's a very different world and system. In that kind of world, right, what Christians could do to really change or reform things is very different than what Christians can do when they're in a society that's fairly open, where they have access to public life, where in fact they hold offices where they themselves exercise public power, where they have economic and financial wherewithal, where there are fairly free systems of communication whereby people can talk to one another and reach one another and communicate with one another. In other words, different ages, different cultures, have different responsibilities because of the opportunities and the disadvantages they're presented with. We happen to live in a country that it is hard to imagine we could be responsible as Christians and ignore the fact that we live in a country whose decisions seriously affect almost everyone else on earth. You know? And to act as if, well, yeah, that goes on, but it's not my business, it seems to me is a dereliction of duty. Right? In a way that perhaps in another place, in another time, it would have been much easier for people to say, I, I don't know what's happening. You know, I'm living here in feudal Europe. I have no idea what's going on in the rest of the world. In fact, I don't even know there is a rest of the world. You know? uh, and so in, my, in that world, taking care of my family, being a responsible neighbor to the few people I know in this little village or town or manor, uh, that might have been what all that could reasonably be asked of people in terms of their moral responsibilities. But in this kind of culture, in this kind of nation, I think it's hard to think that we satisfy our moral responsibility by simply saying, well, I've got my family and my friends, that's all I really have to worry about. Yes? Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to the, um, the separation that kind of occurred in the 70s uh, with I think the delineation between conservative Catholics and more liberal Catholics and where that is today uh, and um, in explaining that maybe just the issue to focus it around would be immigration, mm -hmm. it, it, um, illegal, legal, however that can be spoken to. Okay. Uh, the divides between quote the liberal and conservative are not new with the 70s. They may have gotten a little more public, they may have been a little more bitter and some of the public exchanges, but it's always there. I mean, I could show you some really good, you know, knockdown, drag out arguments between Charles Coughlin, who was the radio priest of his time, who was critical of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Monsignor John Ryan, who uh, worked for Roosevelt in a number of ways and was very active in the National Labor Relations Board and was a great defender of Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, these people would really go after one another in public on radio, which was, of course was the major medium of the time. All right? uh, I, can, I can show you arguments between bishops. 
that would knock down, drag them out arguments between people like John Ireland, uh, the Bishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis, and Bishop John McQuay, the Bishop of Rochester, uh, over the whole question of Catholic schools and should we be investing in Catholic schools or use our monies to improve public schools. Real knockdown, drag them out arguments in public on this. So there's always been these kinds of debates. I mean, the fact of the matter is, it is not, it seems to me, anywhere written in the gospel, thou shalt not have parochial schools, right? But it's also not written anywhere, uh, you know, thou shalt have parochial schools, right? These are best judgments, prudential guesses, you know, reasonable strategies that intelligent people try to formulate and make in terms of what's the best way of advancing the well-being of the Christian tradition. But could people have disagreements about that? Yes. And did they? And the answer is yes. So the differences have always been there. Right? I think what made them a bit more rancorous was as Catholics came into more and more power in this society, now when Catholics disagreed, it wasn't just a fight between Catholics, but frequently Catholic conservatives and Catholic liberals were stalking horses for wider groups of conservatives and liberals on these issues. And that some of the arguments being played out. So for instance, does anybody think that the arguments between uh, you know, uh, John Kerry and certain Catholic bishops in the last election about whether or not he could receive communion if he showed up, that that was a purely intramural Catholic debate? Hardly, right? There were Republicans and Democrats who have never been inside a Catholic church deeply involved in that, cheering one side or the other on, right? Very interested in what the outcome of that was going to be. So what happens is today, a lot of these seemingly intramural issues are really issues of the wider society getting played out in terms of Catholic parlance. Right? I think that's really the best way to understand this learning. And sometimes those debates, the people pushing them, neither side has the particular best interest of the Catholic Church in involved. What they have is they have their political agenda that they're rooting for on one side or the other. You know? uh, in terms of uh, the immigration issue, well, you know, the world looks very different to someone like me, who grew up in the Northeast, uh, and who has lived in, uh, I lived in Washington, but went through a huge wave of immigration in the uh, 80s with the, war, the civil wars in Central America, uh, in El Salvador, and then problems in Guatemala, and then problems in, in Nicaragua. And there were huge waves of migration from those Central American nations into the greater Washington area and it changed whole neighborhoods in less than a decade. And, uh, and so I could see that, and while on the one hand I welcome that for the most part, I could see people living in those neighborhoods who all of a sudden felt, you know, gee, life is changing all around me, and you know, gee, I bought this house and I've sunk most of my life savings into it, and now I'm the only person on my block who speaks English as the first language, or whatever it may be, or the school where I send my kid, they're spending more time doing English as a second language than they are teaching math to my kid, or whatever it may be, and you hear these kinds of complaints and stories. And I, I don't want to dismiss that and say, oh, that's all bad, or that's all just racist, or that's all just, you know, uh, you're apathetic to the plight of others. You know, different peoples Oxes get gored in different ways in these kinds of things. Uh, and so I, I think one of the things we should do in this stuff is not presume ill will on either side. I mean, I've, uh, I've been involved, as Tim mentioned, a good deal of my professional life working on issues of war and peace. And one of the things I've learned living in Washington and doing a lot of this kind of work over the years and, and talks and you know consultancies and that is uh, some of the most admirable people I know and some of the people most dedicated to peace are people who are wearing an army un uniform. Right? And, and some of the most violent people I've seen and some of the most vindictive uh, people I've seen uh, go to work in, you know, white shirts and wear ties, and uh, as Thomas Merton said years ago, the only blood they ever see is that their secretary has a nosebleed, you know? But they're really the ones who sometimes are the hawks in some of these matters. So I think in, in so much of this, we should not let ourselves fall prey to stereotypes, should not let ourselves fall prey to, you know, putting people in boxes, ah, 
you say this, you must be that. You know, you must be racist because you oppose this. Or, or you must be a bleeding heart liberal, you know, we got all this idealism, but you don't know the real world because you hold that. It's too simple and it's too easy to dismiss arguments by dismissing the people who hold them. Right? Much better to try to engage these things at the level of ideas. And I think when you do, you realize that the immigration thing is a very complex debate. You know, there are pluses and minuses on questions of controlling borders. Uh, there are pluses and minuses on issues of amnesties. You know, uh, and I don't think you know you can resolve it simply by saying, "Well, I, I want to do what's right." I, I don't presume anybody in the debate wants to do what's wrong. You know, uh, the real issue is. How can we try and do the right thing and do it smartly? You know, it's not just a matter of having good intentions. It's in fact a matter of how do we bring about the fairest amount of justice and the greatest amount of justice and the fairest society for the most people? What strategies work to do that? And I think on that, you know, we're as good as our arguments. You know, and it shouldn't be a matter of whether I'm more Catholic than you are because I hold this. One of the things I think one has to admit in this is the church does have a bias in this regard. It probably is my bias as well, right? But the church does have a bias, and that is the church tends to be pro-immigration. And if you've listened to what I was saying about the history of this church, you understand why, right? We've understood ourselves to be an immigrant church. And many of these new immigrants are in fact coming from populations that are largely Catholic. So, you know, some of this is institutional self-interest. You know, we just have to acknowledge that's at least a piece of the Catholic agenda here is there is a certain amount of institutional self-interest in terms of our policies and immigration and immigration. Yes. You spoke with um We'll Ro make this the last question, I think, okay? Okay. Uh, with Roe versus Wade, you said in the seventies, it gave uh, American Catholics kind of a uh, a counterpoint to American culture and it was coming from an Anglican culture and Angl like an Episcopalian culture and Catholics were able to take this this opposing viewpoint but with the legalization of abortion in Mexico uh -huh. which is very much so a Catholic population um, would you say this is a simply reflection of this right to be critical of the religion this this dialogue that's happening within the church and uh, what do you think is the responsibility of American Catholics as being neighbors, as being part of this global Catholic community, um, with that change in such a Catholic Catholic based culture? Mm. Well, part of the thing there in Mexico, you have to realize again, is is the Mexican history here. There is a long standing animosity, right, that goes back and predates the Mexican Civil War, you know, in the thirties. There's a long standing animosity between, you know, the government and the Catholic Church. You know, not unlike the experience that many French people have of Catholicism, you know, because the church is was such a different player in Mexican history compared to say US history, right? Where here we were this minority, right, and something of the marginal outsider, right, until fairly recently. In Mexico, the church was so obviously omnipresent, so obviously an institutional player, so obviously a force in the culture, that to try to press for reform or change in the culture was almost by definition also to press for reform or resistance to the Catholic Church. I mean, it's not unlike you know what went on in the French Revolution, right? I mean, it would be very hard, it was very hard to oppose the Ancien Regime without also opposing the institutional church because the two were so wedded, right? Something of the same thing is part of the dynamic there, you know? So I don't interpret necessarily what's happened in Mexico in terms of that vote uh, on, on abortion in Mexico City. I don't necessarily interpret that as, uh, you know, in the same way I read, you know, U.S. abortion history. That is, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think there's a different overlay in terms of both the political history and the social forces that are at work there. Thank you.